tonight. I'd like for you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 7, and verse number 13. Matthew 7, verse 13. I'm going to talk to you tonight about what the Lord Jesus Christ said about hell. What did he say? Matthew 7, verse 13. He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word tonight. You know who's going to hear this. You know who you want to hear it. I pray that you'd use it for the glory of God. I pray you'd reach into their heart and into their soul and speak to them before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name, amen. What Jesus said about hell. Now, folks like to quote Christ, and they like to quote the Sermon on the Mount. And they like to use him and lift him up as an example of how they want to live. And a lot of these things are noble things, no question about that. It, I would like to meet the man who could live like Christ. I haven't met him yet, but I would certainly would like to meet one who lived like he did. And uh, absolutely. But the bottom line is you have to take everything that Christ said if you're going to take him and use him as a teacher. And nobody ever lived on this earth that said more about hell than he did. So let's talk about what he said tonight. Just him. That's the only one I'm going to quote. The Word of God has much to say about hell, a whole lot, beginning in the Old Testament and running all the way through the New Testament and all the different aspects of it and how you can approach it and what you're talking about. Scripture's got a lot to say about it. But tonight, I'm going to limit myself to what Christ said himself. And as I said to you a moment ago, nobody, nobody is recorded in this Bible as ever preaching more on hell than he did. But the truth is that you, ever, you never hear it today. You don't hear it in the churches. You don't hear it from the preachers. It's not part of the, uh, of the religious scene today. It's not popular. It's not positive. It's not... Uh, self-affirming. It doesn't help with your self-love image. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that people want to hear today. But the truth of the matter is, I'm a Bible believer. I believe what the Bible says. I'm going to accept the scripture at its word, face value. So I'm going to take what it says. In the book of Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 22, the Lord Jesus says this about hell. He said in Matthew 5, 22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now he made it very clear that hell is a place of fire. Hell fire, he called it. So the Lord Jesus Christ says that hell is a place of fire. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, he said, But if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Remember this tonight. You have a soulish body. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about Gehenna, the trash heap outside Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnom. He's talking about your soulish body that, uh, that will be cast into hell, fire. And so the warning from the Lord Jesus Christ is very clear. He said that there is a place where you should be, that you could be cast into, and that if it's, if it's necessary to go to the extreme measure and pluck out your eye. Verse 30, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If people in the world today really believed that they're going to stand in a judgment when they leave this world and be held accountable for their life in this world, you would see an immediate change 
in the way people treat each other. It's not going to make them holy. You can't make yourself holy. You cannot do that. That is utterly impossible. But it would change the way a lot of people live if they thought that hell, fire, and damnation awaited them at the moment they left this world. In Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 20, if you notice that we're in Matthew, over and over again, Matthew the publican records what the Lord Jesus said about hell. Matthew the publican says more. Matthew says more, quotes Christ more on hell than any of the other gospels. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now there are those who try to teach you that the body that he's referring to is the physical body that goes into the trash heap and, and is destroyed in the trash heap. But there's no way in the world when you read this and take it on face value that you can accept that as referring to your body. He talks about it being destroyed in hell. So it's the soulish body that he's talking about. Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 23, he says this, And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it is, shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. What he's saying here is that God Almighty will judge you or your culture or your age according to the light you have. And to, therefore your culpability and responsibility is directly related to that. And here we have the Lord Jesus saying, you'll be brought down to hell. The Lord Jesus made it very clear that you're going to be brought down to hell. Matthew chapter number 23 and verse number 33. Notice we're still in Matthew. Matthew chapter number 23 and verse number 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now, if you try, don't, don't offend me or anyone else with your condescending, patronizing attitude as to say that's death. Everybody dies. Everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to die. Here he says plainly, you generation vipers, how can you escape mortal death? No. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? That's as plain as it can possibly be. But there are those today, because of their agenda, because of their blindness in their religion, that will spin this to try to make it look like he's talking about physical death. There's no way in the world that it has anything to do with physical death. It has to do with damnation, condemnation. Matthew chapter number 25 and verse number 41, the Lord Jesus says this, Matthew 25 and verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a horrible thing for a human being to hear said to them, Depart from me. My goodness gracious, a person might have lived a, 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 an exemplary life, a, 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 the kind of life where the whole community talks about how wonderful and great and and what a benevolent person this was. And, and this person was, was, you know, gave and was, and was, a, was a good individual morally. Uh, there's no way that somebody like that could go to hell. You don't go to hell because of the fact that you are moral or immoral. You go to hell because you don't have anybody to keep you out of hell. That's why you go to hell. There's only one that can keep you out of hell. Just one. The Lord Jesus Christ. Just one. There's just one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's only one who went to the cross and suffered hell on the cross. There is no way that a person living in 2015 can have any concept whatsoever of the type of suffering involved in a crucifixion. And this is what he's talking about here. Note carefully, he says, in Matthew chapter number 25 and verse 41, he said, Then shall they, he say to them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a direct reference to hell, folks. It's a direct reference to the burning flame of everlasting fire. 
In Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 18, the Lord makes this statement about his church. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, let me say this to you tonight. Hell's gates have opened wide, and hell is spewing out everything it possibly can against the church of God. It's doing everything it possibly can to destroy his church. And so we have the emerging church movement saying to people, if you're going to be relevant, you're going to have to throw the Bible out and you're going to have to follow your feelings and deal with people on the basis of the cultural norms, how people feel today. And so the Bible is not relevant and out it goes. That's not the church. And when the Presbyterians come together and they vote as to whether or not they should, uh, they should accept quote, quote unquote same sex marriage, that's not a church. Amen. If the day ever comes at Temple Baptist Church has a controversy in the side of this building as to whether we should unite two sodomites together, close the doors, turn the lights out, and go home. You have ceased being a church. The church of God is a place to rescue sodomites. It's a place where people get saved. It's a place where people can have their, to have the chains and the bondage of sin broken from them. The church of the living God, he said, I'll build upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Our politicians are so arrogant and, and, and such a condescending smart alecks that they think that by persecution that they can wipe out the church. In Russia, for example, communism burned church buildings, murdered uh, Russian Orthodox priests, closed their buildings down, did everything they possibly could to stamp out the Christian faith in Russia. This is not a blanket endorsement of Russian Orthodoxy, not at all. But folks, there are saved people over there. No question about it. And today, whether Vladimir Putin is genuine in his faith, I don't know. It may all be a political ruse. Who knows? But the bottom line is that every time he has a meeting anymore in front of the people of Russia, he's got the patriarch of the, of the, Russian, of the Russian Orthodox Church sitting next to him. And he is publicly supporting the Russian Orthodox Church. And he's, and he's, and he's doing everything that he can through his government to, to make it viable in that country. It sounds to me like communism's dead, Amen. but Christianity's alive and well Amen. in good old Mother Russia. But what a sad commentary about good old America. Look at us. Look at our country. And look at what's happening here. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, then, preacher, what should we do to remain relevant? What do you mean, remain relevant? What do you mean, what should we do? I'm going to do what my great-great-great-great-grandfather did. And my great, 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 great grandmother did. And your great, 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 great grandfather and your great, 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 great grandmother. Our family members that through blood, sweat, and tears handed up the word of God and passed it down to us. The legacy we have tonight when we stand in this nation and we stand up with the freedoms and liberty to preach the word of God. I'm going to do what they did. I'm going to preach the book, the Bible. Amen. You remember I was talking to you about Lester Roloff and J. Harold Smith. <clears throat> Men like Billy Sunday and Dwight L. Moody, Sam Jones. We can begin to name these men that lived before us. Peter Cartwright. Some of these are Methodist preachers, old-fashioned, circuit-riding Methodist preachers. These men went out, and what did they do? They opened up the Bible, and they began to preach the Word of God. They didn't preach politics. They preached the Bible. And why did they do that? They did that because the power of God is in His Word. So upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It will not prevail against us. They can come against us. They can, chain, uh, they can chain the doors shut, lock it, and turn the lights out and say, that's it. We've done with, we, we're going to stamp out the church. What a fool. Do you realize that persecution only purifies the church? That's right. Per persecution purifies the church. Strengthens his people. Just like those 10,000 cops over there in North, e in, in North Africa, there in Egypt, coming together in joy all over their faces, rejoicing and praising God because 20 of their number had had their heads cut off. They didn't rejoice because the men died. They rejoiced because of the power of God was there and they knew that they are not going to stamp out his church. And he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not going to do it. It's not going to happen. But he is definitely today purging it. 
The church in America is being purged, no question about it. And it's going to continue to be purged. So the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Matthew, these things that I've read to you tonight make direct references to hell. Mark and Luke have corresponding passages that talk about the same thing. And in many cases, I believe they're talking about the same event that the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching about. In Luke chapter number 16, the only place that we find this, and this is so con should be very familiar to you, in Luke chapter number 16 and verse 23, the rich man died, the Bible says, and was buried. Verse 22, and in hell he lift up his eyes, note carefully, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This has been assaulted more than any passage in the New Testament because it's the clearest statement about a man dying and being buried and then he's still conscious and he raises up his head in hell and he's screaming in torments and he's able to see Abraham afar off across a gulf and he's able to communicate with Abraham. And of course what's happening here is the fact that, that the paradise section of hell and the suffering section of hell were still in their original location. It hadn't been changed. But once the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he led captivity captive. He led the paradise side out of hell and carried it into heaven with him. But at this time, when he gave this story here in Luke 16 about the rich man, uh, it was still there. So it's not like that right now. But uh, at this time, it was like that. He could see across the gulf. And Abraham said, I can't come to you. For there is a mighty gulf, a huge separation that keeps us apart. And I cannot cross over to where you are. The rich man said, well, send my five brethren. Send somebody to warn my five brethren. Send Lazarus that he might warn my five brethren, lest they come to this horrible place of torment. So he was in hell. I don't know if you've ever really given any real thought about where you're going when you die. I don't know if you've ever really, really considered the fact that you're going to die. If the Lord Jesus Christ does not come back soon, and with God a thousand, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years, for him that liveth from ever to ever, from everlasting to everlasting, the eternal one, our little short lifespan, James said, is but a vapor. I mean, that's how long we're here. We're, we're here, we're gone. And he is eternal. From everlasting to everlasting, he's God. We're here and we're gone. You're going to go. Some of you will leave tragically. You'll leave an accident. Some of you will die from sicknesses and disease. Some of you may, be, may even be murdered at the hand of some killer. Or you may be killed in a car accident. And some of you may live long on this earth into your 90s or possibly even be, become a centenarian and live 100 years or more. We don't know how long we're going to be here. The issue of how long we're here is not the issue. It's about where you're going when you die. What's going to happen to your soul when you die? You're watching too much Hollywood if you think that the music is going to play softly and you're going to have all of this preparation time, you know, and they can come in and pray with you and, and you know, and you're going to be ready and then you'll have time to get yourself ready. No, you may not. You may not. You may drop dead when you get up to walk out that back door. You say, well, when I get old, I'll worry about that. No, young people drop dead. Young people drop dead. Did you know that a lot of people, young people right now are having strokes? They're having strokes, young people. It was unheard of when I was a kid, but it's happening. And heart attacks, the, nat the, the natural forces working against this body. You've seen what I've been through in the last, uh, started in October of 2012. It's, it, the body just wears out. It wears down. And it becomes, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's weak, the Bible said. It's a vile body. You could die at any moment. Do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know? There's only one way to be certain tonight, dear friend, and that's the Lord Jesus. Either you have him or you don't have him. And you're not playing games with God when it comes down to that moment when you cross over the bar and you leave your loved ones behind and you look off into eternity. 
That's not, a, uh, that's, not a, that's not an exciting thing if you're not ready to meet God. I've got a letter here I want to read for you tonight. This letter, uh, I think the person who wrote it would like for you to hear it. They'd like for as many people as possible to hear it. Dear Mom, I'm writing to you from the most horrible place I've ever seen and more horrible than you could ever imagine. It is black here, so dark that I cannot even see all the souls I'm constantly bumping into. I only know they're people like myself from the blood-curdling screams. My voice is gone from my own screaming as I writhe in pain and suffering. I cannot even cry for help anymore. It's no use anymore. There's no one here that has any compassion at all for my plight. The pain and suffering in this place is absolutely unbearable. It so consumes my every thought. I could not know if there were any other sensation to come upon me. The pain is so severe it never stops day or night. The turning of days does not appear because of the darkness. What may be nothing more than minutes or even seconds seems like endless years. The thought of this suffering continuing without end is more than I can bear. My mind is spinning more and more with each passing moment. I feel like a madman. I cannot even think clearly under this load of confusion. I fear I'm losing my mind. The fear is just as bad as the pain, maybe even worse. I don't see how, many, how my predicament could be any worse than this, but I am in constant fear that it might be at any moment. My mouth is parched and will only become more so. It is so dry that my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. I recall that old preacher saying that what Jesus Christ endured as he hung on that old rugged cross, there is no relief, not so much as a single drop of water to cool my swollen tongue. To add even more misery to this place of torment, I know that I deserve to be here. I'm being punished justly for my deeds. The punishment, the pain, the suffering is no worse than I justly deserve. But admitting that now will never ease the anguish that burns eternally in my wretched soul. I hate myself for committing the sins to earn such a horrible fate. I hate the devil that deceived me so that I would end up in this place. As much as I know it is an unspeakable wickedness to think such a thing, I hate the very God that sent his only begotten son to spare me this torment. I can never blame the Christ that suffered and bled and died for me, but I hate him anyway. I cannot even control my feelings that I know to be wicked, wretched, and vile. I am more wicked and vile now than I ever was in my earthly existence. Oh, if only I had listened. Any earthly torment would be far better than this. To die a slow, agonizing death from cancer, to die in a burning building as the victims of 9-11 terror attacks, even to be nailed to a cross after being beaten, beaten unmercifully like the Son of God. But to choose these over my present state, I have no power. I do not have that choice. I now understand that this torment and suffering is what Jesus bore for me. I believe that he suffered, bled, and died to pay for my sins, but his suffering was not eternal. After three days, he arose in victory over the grave. Oh, I do so believe, but alas, it is too late. As the old invitation song says that I am remembering, that I remember hearing so many times, I am one day too late. We are all believers in this terrible place, but our faith amounts to nothing. It is too late. The door is shut. The tree is fallen, and there shall it lay. In hell, forever lost. No hope, no comfort, no peace, no joy. There will never be any end to my suffering. I remember that old preachers he would read, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. And that is perhaps the worst thing about this terrible place. I remember I remember the church services. I remember the invitations. I always thought they were so corny, so stupid, so useless. It seemed I was too tough for such things. I see it all different now, Mom. But my change of heart matters nothing at this point. I have lived like a fool. I pretended like a fool. I died like a fool. And now I must suffer the torments and anguish of a fool. Oh, Mom, how I miss so very much the comforts of home. Never again will I know your tender caress across my fevered brow. No more warm breakfast or home-cooked meals. Never again will I feel the warmth of the fireplace on a frosty winter's night. Now the fire engulfs not only this perishing body, racked with pain beyond compare, but the fire of the wrath of Almighty God consumes my very inner being with an anguish that cannot be properly described in any mortal language. 
I long to just stroll through a lush green meadow in the springtime and view the beautiful flowers, stopping to take the fragrance of sweet perfume. Instead, I am resigned to the burning smell of brimstone, sulfur, and a heat so intense that all the other senses simply fail me. Oh, Mom. As a teenager, I always hated having to listen to the fussing and whining of the little babies in church and even at our house. I thought they were such an inconvenience to me, such an irritation. How I longed just to see for a brief moment one of those innocent little faces. But there are no babies in hell, Mom. There are no babies in hell, dearest mother. The only scriptures inside the charred walls of the damned are those that ring in my ears. Hour after hour, moment after miserable moment, they offer no comfort at all, though and only serve me to remind me of what a fool I have been. Were it not for the futility of them, Mom, you might otherwise rejoice to know that there is a never-ending prayer meeting here in hell. No matter, there is no Holy Spirit to intercede on our behalf. The prayers are so empty, so dead. They amount to nothing more than cries for mercy that we all know will never be answered. Please warn my brothers, Mom. I was the eldest and I thought I had to be cool. Please tell them that no one in hell is cool. Please warn all my friends, even my enemies, lest they come also to this place of torment. As terrible as this place is, Mom, I see that it is not my final destination. As Satan laughs at all of us here, and multitudes join us continually in this feast of misery, we are constantly reminded that someday in the future we will all be summoned individually to appear before the judgment throne of Almighty God. God will show us our eternal fate written in the books. Next to all our wicked works, we will have no defense, no excuse, nothing to say except to confess the justice of our damnation. Before the supreme judge of all the earth, just before being cast in our final destination of torment, the lake of fire, we will have to look upon the face of him who willingly suffered the torments of hell that we might be delivered from them. As we stand there in this holy presence to hear the pronouncement of our damnation, you will be there, Mom, to see it all. Please forgive me for hanging my head in shame. As I know, I will not be able to bear to look upon your face. You will already be conformed into the image of the Savior, and I know it will be more than I can stand. I would love to leave this place and join you and so many others. I have known for my few short years on earth, but I know that will never be possible, since I know I can never escape the torments of the damned. I say with tears, with sorrow and deep despair, that can never be completely described. I never want to see any of you again. Please don't ever join me here in eternal anguish. Your son, your daughter, condemned and lost forever. Father, bless your word. May you use it tonight to open hearts and open souls. For I know my Lord Jesus went to the cross and he tasted every single human being's death so that we could be saved. In thy sweet holy name I pray, amen. <laughs>